Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Philip Aaron, and this is I'm, I'm David Faust. Yeah. Um, so we also both work on uh, GCC Rust, and so this is sort of going to be a little bit of an extension from what we were all talking about at Kang Rios um, there a few days ago. So hopefully, uh, we we'll hopefully turn this a bit more into a discussion um, about different things rather than uh, an overview. Um, so yeah, so this is a discussion, not a talk. Um, we'll give maybe just a very quick, like one minute interview, just in case there's people that don't know what this project is. But then I kind of want to, we want to pivot to talk about versioning. Um, and if there's time, there's other things, maybe we could talk about other things that came up with the Kang Rios microconference, you know, like command line arguments, for example. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so this was a slide that uh, we didn't really have until this morning, but we realized that um, there might be people who show up to this who are interested in the project, but have never heard of it. So basically, what GCCRS is, is what it sounds like. It's just a full implementation of Rust on top of GCC and the rest of the GNU toolchain as a language front end for GCC. Um, so we have a front end that does all the parsing and lexing, obviously, and then moves through the various uh, compiler stages to do things like all the macro expansion and type checking, type inference, um, all the checks and lints that you need for Rust, and then as the sort of last stage of that, instead of lowering to something more like Rust C would do to go towards LLVM, we just pass off our version of the high intermediate representation to build GCC trees and hand it off to GCC to do it that way. Um, and so the real um, benefit of this is that we get all of the stuff that GCC has already built in, and we are a completely separate compiler, a second compiler for the language from Rust C, which is sort of until now been the Rust compiler. And that means that there are more targets that the GCC backend can support, because um, there are some targets that GCC and the GNU toolchain target that LLVM doesn't. And it also means that hopefully it will drive a little bit more of adoption of Rust more widely for companies that say are only using GCC and don't really want to pick up LLVM or another toolchain that way. The goal for the project is really just to be a full alternate, uh, a full alternative compiler to LLVM, um, but we're going to be reusing things from the rest of the Rust ecosystem because obviously that's what defines what Rust is. You know, things like libcore and libstandard, having those shared between the two compilers is a sensible thing to do. It wouldn't make sense to have a completely different standard library because then it's not the same language. Uh, yeah, um, so as we said before, Kangrios, like um, our goal at the moment has always been we need to get compiled libcore. Like it's it's such an intrinsic thing. It's so tied to everything. One of the benefits of that is actually if you compile libcore with minimal or no changes, it means you're doing things right uh, because it defines so many really subtle things about like, for example, the layout of dynamically sized types. It's so intrinsic and it's so built in. It means you're doing things in the right way. So. Uh, we've been targeting Rust uh, libcore 149, uh, mostly because it doesn't have really constant generics there, but in 150 it does. So it's kind of this little uh, little barrier there to simplify things for us for right now. We've also found libcore 129 is actually another interesting use case there, mostly because by accident we just tried it and expanded, and so we're using it also as another little thing recently. Um, but yeah, at the moment we're working through trying to get ahead of things, as I said before, and by targeting things like constant generic or parser support so we can name resolve them. There's some bits and pieces in type checking there we still need to finish off. Um, but yeah, this is a way of trying to get ahead whenever we eventually do get 149 in there. The bulk of our work right now is all about getting all the intrinsics and built-ins working. Um, and language feature-wise, really it's closures and opaque types are the major things blocking us there. Um, obviously, in the future, we have mentioned before, we want to you know, borrow check, which is obviously we're targeting Polonius, and we have a branch that starts that work, which is kind of exciting, I think. Um, it's it's a pretty interesting project. 
Um, but overall, and one of the things um, Arthur has done this year has done a lot of focus on testing and bulking that out, which has been pretty interesting. Um, but one of the funniest things we find is that, oh, we ran the Rusty test suite and, oh, we tried to match error codes for like whenever test cases are expected to fail. And then, oh, this looks like we're doing quite well, but then we want to guarantee we're doing things right here. Like obviously our failures were maybe seg faults, <laughs> you know, or maybe just failing for the wrong reasons. Um, but uh, so, yeah, one of the things we're doing this year is also error codes as well. So uh, we will think it's a good time uh, to start looking at that as well. Um, so, yeah, this is just a quick update of where we are for those who don't know. The bulk of what we wanted to maybe try and talk about today was potentially about unstable features and eventually versioning. Um, so, yeah, this morning uh, we were also just sort of looking through um, the unstable features list on Rossi. Um, like, for example, we saw like, oh, feature receiver trait and things like that. And we're like, oh, I'm not even sure what that is. I'm not sure what the status of that is. But then there's things like symbol mangling, which make an awful lot of sense and have been stabilized. And there's an associated Rust C version associated with that. Yeah. And so sort of the, the real takeaway we got is there's a lot of features. Obviously, this is a conference about Linux and not a compiler. So that's why we're focusing on this Linux thing, because Rust for Linux has been one of the guiding targets of GCCRS to be able to fully compile, you know, whatever Rust features the project is using. Um, but the problem is that if things are, if we're relying on things that are not stable, then it's very hard to make any guarantees that both compilers will agree on the behavior for that unstable thing. What we really wanted to talk about and start a discussion, hopefully, is what are the things that Rust for Linux is using that are unstable and sort of what, how important are they for the project and what is the path forward in terms of those becoming stable language features that we can actually have some semblance of agreement between compilers on how we implement these things. So feel free at any point to interrupt with questions or whatever or answers to some of our questions because we'd love <laughs> to hear them. Uh, <laughs> Glad these don't pick up the bounce. Uh, I was going to ask, is your primary concern the unstable features that are used in Rust for Linux or also the unstable features that are currently used in, say, libcore and libstandard? Those is probably yes. a bit of both, yeah. <laughs> okay. Because I know <laughs> the ones that are used in Rust for Linux, there's a to-do list they're being worked through. I'm sure we will get that to working on stable right. eventually. The ones in libcore, some of those are not really on a track to getting stabilized, but a lot of the ones in libstandard, we actually are interested in stabilizing and getting libstandard closer to being standard Rust without special extensions that other libraries don't get to have. And that would also help you in that sense, that uh, libstandard would be closer to something you can just download and compile. Yeah, I think one of the things we've noticed was that uh, there's been even um, features like requested by from the Rust for Linux project into Rust C, which is interesting, um, which makes it maybe slightly more difficult as well there. Um, so we were sort of wondering what sort of the, the motivation is there, I guess, but um, and what sort of ex expectations people would have with that as well. Yeah. Um, so like we put these in here as just some random examples because there's kind of like the one on top, we have no idea what that is and it's their status is unclear or well, it's like symbol mangling is pretty obvious oh there's a stabilized version and that's great um so one of the things we're talking about like versioning you know so is targeting specific rust editions something that the rust for linux project wants to do or is it down the line of do they want to start targeting specific rust c versions is sort of where we're trying to look at this from like what sort of thing would you expect from an alternate compiler here So um, one of the things particularly with this versioning issue, right, is that uh, currently Rust for Linux pretty much looks at uh, what is the most recent version of Rust and the Rust compiler. And that's fine, but as soon as we have this alternate compiler available, the question becomes how do we make sure those stay in sync? And what is it actually reasonable to rely upon from a, from a project perspective? You know, is, 
if the kernel is relying on unstable features, and that's just one aspect of it, then guaranteeing that there's compatibility between multiple compilers becomes very difficult. And so we'd like to see those stabilized. And what do they do? They get stabilized eventually in some version of Rust C, which is great. But the cadence of the releases of Rust C is very different from, um, say, the cadences of releases of GCC. And so it seems to us that it's not very sensible to depend upon whatever rolling language version is most recent, but to actually have some sort of plan for targeting specific additions or features that are available, um, since that's sort of the, the more longer term stable option for Rust is the addition. So, uh, so we are targeting the, the latest just because we are using the right. unstable feature. Yeah. So for the moment, uh, that will probably continue for a while. But it's true that at some point, what we will want to do is declare a minimum version, like we like the kernel does for GCC, Clang, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, it could be synchronized with an addition, with the addition that it introduces. Please don't. I mean, but, but. Please don't. <laughs> I mean. Uh, no. Uh, I think it's picking a, a, picking right? a minimum version is completely fine. It's more, we have spent a great deal of time trying to uh, explain to people that additions are not long-term stable versions of Rust. They're just the version of Rust that happened to be released on a three-year cadence. They don't have any particular set of like, this is the set of new features we added. The only things that are tied to an addition are these are the features that required us to bump the revision of the language such that here's a new version that drops some backward compatibility and all your old code still works with the previous edition. The only thing that's tied to that is now you can compile code for Rust 2021 with these new properties. That isn't tied to any particular features of the compiler typically other than the ones that needed that particular rev of the language. I'm mostly saying, those aren't any better versions than any other to pick as long-term anchors. Just pick a version based on what time window you want to support and don't tie it to an addition. My plan was to pick basically the, as soon as possible. The, 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 when we reach a point where we have all the stable features, just pick that one and start with it for one year or something like that, something yeah. reasonable. And then after a year or something, upgrade it again to a new version, a new minimum version, I guess. Yeah. So that was my plan because it's what we do with GCC and Clang. We don't, I mean, with, with for C, we also have, of course, we use a single standard for all the right. the kernels. So when we switch editions, what the kernel will like to do probably is to switch all, I mean, don't have different editions throughout the kernel, that, but updating the, the entire kernel to the new editions at once. I guess we will do exactly the same as in C. So from that point of view, yeah, we will have a minimum version of Rust C, and then you can target that, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting way to do it. I would have I would have thought it would have been an addition because it's more like a language thing. But yeah, um, I guess it could be possible. It makes it a little bit more difficult for us, um, you know, because like Rusty versions, like they change, they can have anything in them. It can be language changes, it can be security fixes, it can be you know, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, um, yeah, okay. It, it would be one. Random mm. person that where we reach the yeah. point where we can say it and that's it. Then we, if it makes it easier for you, which I hope it, it, it does, yeah. then we would not move it for a while. That's yeah. the idea, right? But that version is likely a long ways out given like all the yeah, 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 yeah. Like, some yeah. of them don't have a long way out. Yeah, yeah. There, is, there are unstable features that, as you see in the list, they are prioritized in yeah, a right. bit. I try to do my, my best to, to prioritize them. There are some things we can remove completely if we, for example, if we have done everything else. And there is only one or two that are left that we can work around. Then we will work around and just establish the minimum because we don't need the. Uh... Yeah. Okay. And um, I suppose actually, in some ways, the Rusty test suite might help with us there when we start doing that. I guess is probably part of that. You know, I suppose it moves along with the compiler. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, then, if that's what the answer is, I, I guess we could look at then. You know, making things easier. Um, you know, one of the things that came up was obviously the way we invoke our compiler is different. So, for example, our compiler you invoke just like you would any other GC compiler, like we talked about. So, just a silly example, minus G minus O2. I think a lot of people at the Linux conference will be familiar with running that sort of thing. Um, 
And so that also means we expose all available GCC flags. Um, so you can choose to, at your own risk, break everything if you like. <laughs> Um, so I guess that might be an issue for you guys and in you're integrating with the build system, uh, I assume. Not necessarily. I mean, if, if you are to the point where you can get this working, I would really, I, I, we can put the time to do the, the different flags in the build system if necessary. Of course, it would be much better if we didn't have to do it. Yeah. But if, if it's something that is like the last thing you need and we could help there, then we could, we could do it. But I think we should plan, if possible, to have a way, what is the, yeah, for other projects as well. What is the plan for you for for having these uh, common flags or common? I don't know. Yeah, but but we could do it. In the kernel, we could do it. It's not the worst thing uh, that okay. we need to do. Okay, it's be easy. Let's say, okay? <laughs> <laughs> reasonably easy. There are like a couple of flags. I think we have to turn on by default. I don't remember what they are off the top of my head right now, but we um, we have an issue to start documenting those um, because obviously you know some rust behavior requires some of these things to be on by default um but yeah um i think one like only one or two of them you can't turn off at the moment but we probably should allow to be turned off i guess um yeah that's that's kind of where we are there i think one of the solutions that arthur was mentioning the letter kangros is that you know we have got a bunch of code to try and map you know, rusty arguments to arguments so there could be something we could reuse there which does sound kind of interesting. So, um, I guess there's no plan to use cargo in Rust for Linux, I assume, from what I've heard. Not for the moment. There are there are some talks about using cargo for vendoring, at least. Mm -hmm. Not just not as a bit system, but as a vendoring system. Or uh, dependency, dependency management, perhaps. There are some talks about it, but at the moment, and, and until we decide otherwise, yeah, we don't have cargo. We, we have we, we use cargo for some testing bits, not for the build of the kernel image. So yeah, no, we don't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, one thing that has come up so far in just discussing with the project has been the the question of how much is actually used from things like liballoc, and whether it's Know, some of some of the unstable features are to help sort of modularize that and break out what is actually needed versus the whole liballoc thing. So I guess there's a, a little bit of a question here of um, how much of it, how to make it a custom liballoc uh, for only what the kernel needs uh, versus the whole thing, and how how do we make sure that um, of modularization of it through the unstable features can percolate into GCCRS mm -hmm. um, to make sure that part of what we're trying to do is to prioritize the development of the compiler to meet the needs of the Rust for Linux project. And since there's so many uh, possibilities in terms of directions and only so much manpower, uh, it really <laughs> helps to direct a little bit where our attention goes. Um, yeah. So I don't know if anybody, if you know offhand, like what are the yeah, so, um, so one thing that you mentioned before was the receiver trait um, as an example of not having a plan for, for stabilizing the feature. Uh, so, so that one, for example, uh, we need it because of liballoc. We just want to have a, a customized version of Arc, right? Okay. And at the moment, there is no support for that. So uh, um, there's actually uh, some people that are going to start working on this uh, sort of thing. But what I'd like to say about that is we don't really care about the receiver trait itself. We care about the ability to come up with a, a customized uh, arc. Um, and we're very happy to change anything on our side as long as uh, some solution is available to us. Um, most of the um, stuff in Libaloc that deals with data structures and collections we've removed because they didn't have support for uh, fallible allocations. So uh, that's, I guess, makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but. Um, yeah, we we moved a lot of things. We just have a small subset of libelog. Yeah, we have. I think right now, uh, sixty percent of I think of the so basically right now what I'm importing is the things we need. So I remove things like collections, all the collections folder that contains. Uh, I remove other things. I could even I think remove more, but yeah, basically it's, we don't touch much. I mean, we don't modify it really. What we are trying to do is only add new methods, basically. Uh, so it should be reasonably easy. I mean, the methods is for example for the fallible allocation. That's the try version that is not there yet. Uh, pretty much what we do right now. 
the um, uh, the versions of these libraries, I assume they're like part of the Rust for Linux project. They're not like part of the compiler, obviously. So, so the liballoc, what I do is I import it. I have an, uh, an adapt right now in the past series. I mean, I have a, an adapt patch that is the delta between the vanilla one and the things that we added. And as you can see, it's quite small. So you can just oh, go through okay. it's very small. So, so is that and we don't do anything fancy. What I mean is that if you can compile liballoc, the vanilla one, you are going to be able to compile the the customized one. Uh, okay. And the idea is that short term, short term, okay, let's say medium term, is that upstream Rust, so Joe's over there, basically, <laughs> <laughs> accepts everything that we need, uh, and uh, and then we can just remove the fork. Okay, that would be the idea, that we can remove the fork from the Rust for Linux 3. Maybe still that we may want to keep it because of some other reason in the future that appears, like we want to customize something in particular. We cannot really tell right now. But the, the, when we started doing it and we had a meeting with the Rust teams, we said, okay, let's compromise here. We are trying to do a, a fork that is a minimal fork and, and with minimal additions so that they can go back to upstream and then really remove it from, from mm -hmm. upstream. Sorry. It was the idea that, oh, if, if we can compile the vanilla versions of these things, we're on the right track? Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, because that's the concern was like, oh, maybe there's something else we're missing here completely. Oh. Okay. And as far as subsetting, if you can compile the whole lib alloc, then yeah, you're almost certainly going to handle the lib alloc within the kernel. If you can't handle the whole lib alloc yet, you may still be able to handle the lib alloc in the kernel because it's largely cutting things out. <laughs> it means we'll be able, we'll be uh, useful. I mean, from what I understand, much harder the lib core yeah. than the alloc. Right. So yeah. yeah, that's why we're trying to kind of yeah. That's, right. Yeah. Right. And so do you use update the versions of these libraries as you change the Rust C version? Can you so repeat? do you update the version of like libcore every time you know when what? no no the core core comes from the compiler. I pick it from the compiler. Yeah, yeah but uh, or yeah. any of them anyway. The core we pick from the compiler. Alloc, oh, lives in the... We 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 basically every time I update the compiler, I update alloc to match the compiler version. Right now. We base our, our patch yeah. Okay, every time a new compiler comes out? Yeah. yeah. So every time the new compiler, I mean, up to now, because now we are freezing things a bit for the merge. But basically, in the, in the normal repository, in the full repository, we we, we will probably continue uh, doing what we were doing, which is upgrade the compiler version and alloc at the same time. I do it in the same time even. Okay. Um. Well, yeah, I suppose like that's one of the things I guess she also uses um, proc macros. Uh, um, yeah, we're hoping in theory that uh, um, it should be we can just reuse that create as what we're going off and then adding the interface. But do you guys um, make any changes there either or not? No, no, no. We, we we use the vanilla one. We use ProMacros, but we don't change the ProMacros. But you well, use, them? You use them? We use ProMacros. Okay, yeah. Yeah. A few of them. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's us anyway. Um, I just sort of wanted to get started the discussion, which I think was good. Um, so yeah, if there's anything else you guys want to raise with us or anything we can do better, feel free. I mean, you have done an amazing job with the time you have had. I, I, I'm amazed at what you can already compile, so. Yeah, it's it's been tough. Like, I think one of the things we're hoping is actually core is just so complicated, but actually once you compile it, everything sort of opens up is what we're hoping. It seems to be the case for us that the more we are able to support, the better it works out. Um, and one of the things I really want to do is try to figure out a way to add no core test cases to Rust C in a way that is happy for everyone. Because I feel like that's definitely a lack. I have a more uh, long-term uh, question for for you guys. Uh, so once once you've reached parity with with Rust C, um, how do you envision uh, the the evolution of the language uh, working out? Because at the moment they have RFCs and people do implementations for Rust C, and they are there as unstable features. Are you going to um, ask people to implement those things into GCC as well, or are you going to catch up later? Or what's 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 the plan? Do you have a plan? And it's okay if you don't. <laughs> I feel like I have I've, I've probably sort of a plan. <laughs> I don't know. Or did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, I was going to say. I mean, the first step along that process is getting the compiler to something that is working and is useful, and then merging that with GCC. And then it will be a question of as those RFCs and things for the Rust language come in and Rust C implements them and bumps versions and such, um, then it will be a question of sort of, uh, does GCC have to catch up? Like, like I mean, these 
options you're suggesting that I'm using them, right? But are we playing catch up or are we able to actually um, be a part of those discussions and help determine what gets stabilized into the language? And as, a, as an aspect of that, end up slowing down potentially some of the uh, additions to the language. Obviously, we don't want to stop new features or whatever is coming up in the language, but um, mm -hmm. be able to make it a little bit more of a stabilized thing that isn't just a single compiler and a language that is defined by its implementation in that single compiler, I think would be, my personal opinion is that it would be very healthy for the language to slow down and mature mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, but that'll be something that we'll have to figure out when we get there. Mm -hmm. Right now, no, I guess there isn't much in the plan. Uh, the only thing I would say is I sort of envisage the project turning a lot more akin to the Ada front end. So with a, more of it being written in Rust and in theory reusing more and more of the Rust C components to some extent to help. But I still think we need to get to a certain parity point first. Yeah. So. I, I was going to echo that exact point actually that um, I am hopeful that when GCCRS can compile more of Rust, then more of the ecosystem will become available and large portions of the ecosystem that help enable Rust are written in Rust. Once it gets to that point, my hope is that uh, rather than needing to slow down, we can help you accelerate yeah, by handing you a time. pile of code that right. implements what mm -hmm. we're doing. There's really like the less things we can write twice, the better. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we can hand you pre-made libraries that solve problems mm -hmm. for you, I am hopeful that that reduces some of the burden there. Right, and yeah. I think the great example of that for me right now is like Polonius, right? right. Factoring out an implementation yeah. of the borrow checker into a library, and then we know that both compilers are have the same borrow checker, and it's not gonna surprise you when you go to compile with a different. For example, yeah. or yeah. Uh, you know, Rust AST or similar, hopefully we can get there. Yeah would be, I guess, the dream, right? Because that, yep. yeah. that lets us maintain the parity and still yeah. add new stuff. Yeah, yeah no bother. I'm happy now. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. Thank you.